Okay, you're all very welcome back for our final session of the day, and that quite appropriately involves Social Justice Ireland. Um, and the theme of, today, of the papers for this session are the years ahead priorities for government in the coming years, and we're going to have four contributions, beginning with Sean Healy himself. Thank you very much. And um, this morning when I was starting, we talked a bit about, I talked a bit about context and how important context is. And uh, I'm not going to repeat all that, but I think context is critical. Um, and um, I think uh, what we have to say now fits into that broader context. But what we're doing in effect is focusing more on Ireland itself. and. Uh, thinking in terms of what would a program for government look like in the next for the next government, for, uh, or maybe over the next 10 years, what would programs for government look like, or should they look like? So we start off maybe by staying with the context issue and taking a look at context in Ireland and where we are right now. And on the one side, um, this is this, this is a two-sided story. On the one hand. Um, we have a, a, a great many positives, a booming economy, um, which is the envy and inverted commas of a lot of people. Um, we have uh, falling unemployment, down from 15% to five and a half, roughly. Um, we have record levels of employment, um, the more, pe more people employed in Ireland than ever before. We have... Um, rising tax receipts in many areas, we have increased consumer demand, we have thriving exports, we have historically low interest rates in every, everything except maybe mortgages, and we have emigrants coming back to Ireland. And people point to this and say we're doing so, uh, very, very well. Government points to it and says we're doing very well. On the other side, however, uh, there are negatives, very substantial negatives, many of them mentioned here already today high poverty levels, social exclusion and dep deprivation. There are 780,000 people uh, living in poverty, a quarter of a million of those are children, 100,000 of them have a job. We have a high homelessness, um, 11,000 plus. We have social housing waiting lists, maybe 80,000 households on waiting lists. And um, we have high levels of public and private debt that tends to be ignored much of the time, but yet is a very important issue and will become a very, a much more important issue uh, when we head into the next uh, downturn. And the downturn there will be, there always has been and we always will be, um, and we're not too ready for it at the moment either. Uh, we have, uh, within the low unemployment, we have high youth unemployment, more than twice the national level. And we have an urban-rural divide that has been mentioned here several times already by Seamus Boland. Um, and he was talking about a particular issue around, around poverty and, and carbon tax. But over half a million homes don't have quality broadband, and yet people are being told that uh, they, they should be able to sort of uh, work from home and so on. Um, so we, and there's a whole lot of other issues uh, that um, were highlighted in, in the, most, the last uh, presentation by Theresa about urban-rural division as well, because much of that local government is in rural Ireland. Not all, but uh, much of it. And we have um, a persistent and pervasive inequalities, and um, disability is an obvious one in that context. Uh, but there's inequalities at a variety of other levels as well. And we're failing to tackle issues like climate change that we talked about earlier today as well. So I suppose as we reflect on this, we're saying economic development is not an end in itself, but a means of providing resources and conditions to secure well-being for all in a substantial manner. And we would suggest that that is not the way it is, uh, the economic development is seen much of the time. It is seen as an end in itself, and it's for some reason or other that if, if we get the economic development right or the economic growth right, uh, everything else will follow. It's not even a matter of economic development. It's a more seen as just economic growth and everything else will follow. So given the context, where do we go now? First thing that we would say is that we need to avoid the mistakes of the past. 
Uh, for example, we should not be focusing primarily on the economy. Yes, the economy is very important. We have to have a focus on the economy, but not to the exclusion of everything else. Not just that. It's, it's a, an issue about sequencing because uh, very often we are told, let's get the economy right, and then we'll come and we'll deal with social issues and environment and the various other pieces. We're simply saying no, that's, uh, what we need to le learn is these things need to be done simultaneously. And then we also need to uh, not make the mistake of servicing um, it's our, and failing to secure the balances that are required, whether they're urban rural or young old or gender or whatever they happen to be. There are many balances. We have a long history of failing to have balanced development. So how should we proceed? Well, we would suggest that there are five questions that they overlap, but that they would be worth asking and answering. Where should Ireland be in five or 10 years time? Let's be concrete about this. Not just in terms of apple pie and motherhood, but in terms of really concrete development. What services and infrastructures are required to get to that destination five or ten years from now. How are these services and infrastructure to be delivered? How are they to be paid for? And in all of that, how can we develop and maintain a vibrant and sustainable economy and society? Not just a sustainable uh, uh, economy, but a sustainable society and a sustainable environment as well. Sustainability has more than one leg to it in, in, in that context. We, so the answers, I think, to the questions that we're asking here should be central to informing the structure and the content of a programme for government for the next doyle. So continuing, where do we go now? We need an integrated approach that integrates the economic dimension, about, which is about resources, the political dimensions about decision making, the cultural dimensions that underpin it all, uh, which are the values and so on, uh, the s social dimensions, which basically are the relationships uh, of the, between the different parts of, of, of the society, and finally, an inter in involving the environment and engaging with the environment as well. And we need to integrate all five dimensions, economic, political, cultural, social, environmental. And we need to monitor in implementation. Uh, one of the things that's very weak in the past is that uh, we've had uh, progress of government, and once they're signed, they're not, people don't pay too much heed to them anymore and don't expect to have them implemented. What we're suggesting is that monitoring implementation is critical because the implementation of the Programme for Government is critical. Interdepartmental committee maybe to oversee implementation of the Programme for Government it would be a good idea. It could report quarterly on progress on implementation of every single commitment in the programme. We used to do this, or it used to be done, uh, by an interdepartmental committee uh, during the times of social partnership and for 20 plus years, every quarter, they produced a detailed report on progress on every single commitment contained in the national agreement. If they could do it then, I'm sure they could do it now or into the future. The National Economic and Social Council, we would suggest, should be uh, brought into play and to produce maybe a mid-term review of priorities and provide an assessment of strategic direction. The National Economic and Social Council has all the various sectors of Irish society there, including the government itself. So to have them provide an assessment of strategic direction would be good. And permanent form, we need a permanent form for regular dialogue on policy uh, and ensuring strategic priorities are met. Government has established the National Economic Dialogue, but only meets once a year for a day and a half, totally um, too, too small to achieve the purpose we have here. We're saying basically a permanent forum for regular dialogue and policy, ensuring strategic priorities are, mer are met, and it should discuss social and environmental issues as well as economic issues. And it could, for example, among other things, review implementation of the programme. Thanks, over Sean. To Michelle here. Yes, so I, I'm just going to outline now the five priorities that. I suppose we point to for the programme for government for the, uh, the 33rd doll. So um, I, there's five priority areas here and there's a number of different issues under each one. I'm not going to go through every single issue. I just want to pick some of them. So a vibrant economy, decent, secure, well-funded services and infrastructure, a taxation system that's just and fair, 
good governments and sustainability, by sustainability I mean economic sustainability, social sustainability and environmental sustainability, we see these as the, I suppose, the five building blocks of uh, a programme for government. And you have to look at these areas simultaneously. They all intertwine, they all interconnect. As Sean mentioned, there's no point focusing on one, for example, the economy. Uh, to the detriment of all of the others. We must do everything together. Uh, we must look at them, look at all of them through a particular lens. So, for example, um, a, a thriving economy, it's not a goal in itself. The point of it is to underpin social development. It's to improve the living standards of everybody in society. So how would we do this? So for a start, we should move towards a more just economic structure. Sean outlined the poverty figures there. So we have one in six people living in poverty. A quarter of a million children are living in poverty. So how do we deliver a more just economic structure so that the fruits of economic growth go to everybody in society and the gap between those at the bottom and those at the top is narrowed and the well-being of everybody is improved? Well, you do this by delivering well-funded public services and public investment. But you must plan this because we already have a lot of pressure in terms of our health service, in terms of housing. So how you do this investment must be planned. You have to look at balanced regional development. How do you take the environment and sustainability into account? How do you put environmental issues and your biodiversity and natural resources in the middle of your national accounting system so that if they're depleted, that's a minus? And that's accounted for to everybody in the country on an annual basis. How do you ensure your services are universal when you deliver them based on the seven social, economic and cultural rights? These are the right to sufficient income to live life with dignity, the right to meaningful work, appropriate accommodation, relevant education, essential health care, real participation and cultural respect. If those social, economic and cultural rights underpin everything, the five priorities within this programme for government, then you will deliver a better and fairer future. Obviously, you need a just taxation system that's equitable in order to deliver your just economic structure and your public services. And in terms of that equity, it's not just equity for individuals. It's equity for everybody within the taxation system, including corporates. So those who benefit the most from the system obviously contribute the most, and a fair share of corporate profits must be collected by the exchequer in order to be invested into our public services. We also need to look at our ongoing services, how much they're going to cost, and be realistic about the amount of revenue we need to generate to fund them. And finally, one of the other key points, I think, here in terms of looking at your environmental, social and economic progress is social dialogue. Uh, we had, uh, I suppose, a, a robust discussion earlier around carbon tax and why there wasn't an increase in carbon tax in the recent budget. But the issues that were brought up by Irish Rural Link and by Cara Augustenberg if you had a social dialogue process, these issues would be addressed there. It wouldn't be a surprise to the Minister for Finance the week before the budget that if you increase the carbon tax and don't have a mitigation and transition programme for households at risk of energy poverty or in energy poverty, or for those workers who work, for example, in Board Namona, um, it wouldn't be a surprise to him. So there wouldn't be a no, a no carbon tax in the budget and then you wouldn't have you know, a lot of angry people. If you had a social dialogue process, these are the things that would be teased out within that. So you wouldn't have unintended consequences of, for example, taxation decisions, and you would have a more integrated approach, which would deliver a better and fairer future for everybody. So how, how would you deliver this integrated approach? Well, as I've mentioned, all the five priority areas I've outlined should be developed simultaneously within a competent mechanism, for example, as Sean mentioned, an interdepartmental committee, but also a forum to look at the ongoing monitoring of the strategic priorities of this programme for government and progress towards meeting them. You need to prioritise long-term outcomes. You need substantial investment. And you need to account for demographic changes. So that's an integrated approach. But an integrated approach will not work unless you have communication and collaboration. Why is communication and, co and collaboration, why are they so important? Because in order to do this, you have to make choices and you have to prioritise, <laughs> prioritise issues. So for example, are you going to pick healthcare or childcare? Or is it going to be housing or education in year one? Why are you doing that? Why are you picking that as a priority area for investment? You need to be able to communicate this to people. You need to be able to be realistic about how much time it's going to take so that people will see improvements. 
also be re realistic about how much this is going to cost. You need to be honest about the resourcing and also about progress being made. You need to be able to give regular updates on how you are making progress. And if you're not making progress, why not? Because if there isn't communication, you won't get buy-in from the general public. But if you are honest with the public and if you are realistic, then you will get buy-in buy -in because everybody wants better services. Everybody wants better infrastructure. And if there is a collaborative pro approach, a social dialogue approach, then you would not have the outcomes that we do have in which certain budgetary decisions are made and there are unintended consequences for certain parts of society. If you could eliminate that and be honest about the process, then you will get real buy-in because realistically it will take more than one term of office to deliver on these five priority areas. And we must accept that any approach prioritising the economy over any other areas won't result in a society that is balanced and fair. You need to address economic, environmental and social issues simultaneously in order to improve the living standards for all, not just for us, but for future generations. Now, I've outlined some priority areas there and I've picked up on a few points. But you're going to wonder, like, what are the specific policies that a government could implement that will lead to a vibrant economy, decent services and infrastructure, a just taxation system, good governance and sustainability? So my colleague Eamon now will outline some of these policies. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so Michelle outlined the five pillars of what, um, what the next programme for government should look like. I'm going to look at the first three, and then Colette is going to expand on the last two. The first one was... Um, Excuse me. <coughs> a vibrant economy, and it's a good place to start because the economy is the mechanism by which we generate the resources we need to build a fair society that we all want. I don't need to talk much about why a vibrant economy is important, that's self-evident to anybody here, but we have at the moment a broadly balanced budget, we've got resources there for a rainy day fund, um, our economic fundamentals are pretty strong at the moment despite uh, fairly high levels of public debt. The aim here has to be, of course, to consolidate that prosperity and to take advantage of it. And that's what this is about, this particular column, if you will, of the programme. We need to stabilise the revenue stream, uh, broaden our tax base and increase the tax take. Now, I'll talk more about that later on when we do the just taxation column. But for that, what that means underneath the column of a vibrant economy is a programme for investment and the building of a more just economic structure. As regards investment and the different policy areas where you could do that, I, I, could, I could talk about this for an entire session. I don't have the time for that, of course, but related to the building of a vibrant economy, for me, the two areas that are most important right now from an Irish point of view are housing and broadband. Housing because for the last few years you've had everyone from the Financial Times to the American Chamber of Commerce in Ireland to IBEC, who are none of them, none of whom are bastions of socialist thought. Let's be honest, and they're all talking about how the housing uh, situation in Ireland has gotten to the point where it's inhibiting our productive capacity. And of course, that makes sense because you can't create jobs if you don't have places for people to, for your workers to live. So, solving this particular area is, from an economic point of view, imperative. There's plenty of socially more um, or morally more sound reasons for, for housing people, but from an economic point of view, if that's the language that people want to speak, then this is why you need to, so to deal with the housing issue. And under the broadband column, we are now at a point where the employment situation in Ireland is so different that you wouldn't even recognise the country from what it was in 2012. But the benefits of that growth, that economic growth, the employment growth, is not being spread evenly across the country. And a large part of that is due to infrastructure and broadband as a massive part of that. Aside from the uh, individual cases where you could have people who would be quite happy working from home in a rural setting rather than um, engaging in long commutes which are detrimental to well-being, which are uh, environmentally unsustainable from burning fossil fuels in order to get on the road between the office. Nobody is going to set up uh, a medium or large enterprise in an area where you don't have a decent internet connection. So one of the key priorities for the next programme for government needs to be to sort out the mess that is the rural broadband tendering process at the moment and to front load the investment in that area. We've proposed, I don't know how many times and, and how many different amounts, several different ways you could fund this um, and it's just, it hasn't been tackled yet. But this is 
for me, they're the two key pillars from a, an investment point of view for the generation of a vibrant economy. And the final aspect of that column is to uh, generate a more just economic model. And there are lots of different ways you could do that. I'm just going to look at one just due to time constraints, and that is we believe that the next programme for government should include in it the setting up of a commission to properly investigate the implementation of a basic income in Ireland. Um, a paper that I presented with Sean Ward a couple of years ago at this particular conference, plus other work we've done in the meantime, plus work we'll be publishing before the end of the year, should move the conversation on basic income away from whether or not it's affordable, because any policy you want to implement is affordable depending on the parameters you set, uh, and away from whether it's affordable and on to whether or not it's desirable, how you want to structure it if you do desire it, and what the distributive effects of that will be. So we believe that for the purpose of building um, a social welfare system that interacts properly with an income, ta income tax, sorry, an income system and a taxation system that's fit for the 21st century and the modern labour market, that this is an area that government needs to properly investigate um, and move towards a rights-based approach to social and economic policy. Under the second column, which is decent services and infrastructure, the investment program I referred to is, in is intended to deliver just this. And the two policy areas that are the three policy areas we'll focus on will be housing again and health, just because these are the sticks with which a lot of people tend to beat the government at the moment and with good reason. And also um, in relation to education, how that um, acts or interacts with the labour market. Now, we finally have in this country um, a programme, I suppose that's the best word for it, of, move, of how we're going to move towards a properly accessible single tier universal healthcare system. It's got buy in from all the different political parties, but what it doesn't have is the required investment. And it's, I think the implementation of that has somewhat stalled the last year, year and a half or so. What we are really strong on here is the additional building of primary care networks in order to help alleviate strain on our acute hospitals and A&E departments. Um, additional investment in the area of mental health, which, while not a silver bullet, interacts with so many different areas of social well-being, from education to social isolation to, um, well, <laughs> I'm sure I had another point there somewhere, but it's escaped me. This is why you need to write things down. But, you know, I, I think people understand the way in which mental health is such an important uh, part of well-being across so many different facets. And also, one thing that's really key in relation to healthcare in relation to the demographic trends that are becoming so apparent in Ireland, and will continue to be so until the 2030s, 2040s, and that's the extent to which the elderly population of this country is set to double and then tri triple as a, uh, compared to the proportion that's there at the moment. And we're just not making the necessary investments that are required in order to deal with this. Uh, the first thing that needs to be done is to create a statutory entitlement to a home care package, because the system at the moment essentially operates on the basis that whether or not you get home care services is based on, uh, on geography. Is there availability within the area you're living in? And that's just... it's barely short of a disgrace, I think. And in relation to housing, because of time constraints, because of the fact I have addressed uh, housing already, what I will say here is scribble out my notes on this, insert Tony Fahey's presentation here. Um, we, we believe um, Socialist Ireland is moving very um, strongly in the direction of how how uh, the implementation of a cost rental model needs to be quite central uh, to dealing with the housing issues, but also just it's as simple as supply and demand and getting out there and getting the bricks and mortar and building the, building the units um, and, and dealing with the social housing issue, which will which is sort of a two birds at one stone kind of approach. You uh, you move a family out of the private rental sector into a social house. You've removed somebody from a waiting list, and you've created a, a unit which can be then privately rented. It's it's sort of a no-brainer, or as close to one as you can get. Uh, the final thing I'll say in relation to the decent services and infrastructure column, um, it's it's sort of self-instructive to say that when economies begin to recover and employment uh, takes an upturn, the people who will benefit earliest are the people who are in the best position to take a job. That's just straightforward. And with any recession and recovery, particularly one um, which was as entrenched as Ireland's was for so long, you're always going to have a significant cohort of people who are going to struggle to get work after um, things take uh, a turn for the better. That might be because their skills are now obsolete as a result of 
so many years out of the workforce. It might be because the industry in which they worked has, uh, is still on a downward slope or perhaps uh, their employers, uh, the major employers in it, have left the country altogether. Um, that becomes doubly problematic when, like Ireland, you've got such a small proportion of the population engaged in lifelong learning. Our, our rate is something, um, something like a third to 40 percent of the European average, I believe. And Michelle can correct, can correct me if, uh, if that's wrong. But um, it, it's, in, in investing in the, uh, the facilities by which people can upskill and make sure that people don't get isolated from the labour market in their late 40s or 50s is imperative, not just for our economic well-being, because we're getting to a point now where we're, almost, we're approaching full employment and um, the labour uh, factor is going to have to come from somewhere. So it makes sense that you would invest in this particular area to ensure that people who have been out of work for a long time are brought back into the labour market and can become active in that again. Essentially, I could sum up um, the areas I've just talked about, plus the other aspects of decent services and infrastructure, by saying Ireland needs to move closer to the European norm. And another area where we need to do that is in relation to taxation. Now, there needs to be a strategy by which Ireland moves closer to the European average, regardless of how uh, our tax take is measured, against what metric um, Ireland is well behind our European peers. Now, we've long considered GDP comparisons, not just for taxation, but for a lot of things, to be uh, re reasonably uh, unreliable. That's especially the case since the leprechaun economics controversy of a, a couple of years ago. So what we've, we've done is to move to... Um, a target for government for taxation that's on a per capita basis. We're proposing that the government aim to collect €15,000 per capita in 2017 terms increased along with modified G&I or gross national income which we believe is a much better representation of Irish economic growth and, um, and, our, and the size of the Irish economy. Now, I should emphasise that that's not taking €15,000 off everybody. That's a total tax take from income tax, from VAT, excise duty, corporation tax, all of those things on a per capita basis um, based on using 2017 as a base year. Now, if the government did that this year, they would have increased the tax take by €2.5 billion. Euros. We wouldn't have changed our position in the EU15 at all. We'd still be 10th out of the 15 countries in terms of um, taxation per capita. But we think that given the problems of measuring our, the Ireland, Irish economy size, we think this is a much better and more efficient way of uh, measuring and co making comparisons based on the tax take. Just to go through the bullets very quickly of how you would do that, um, these are potential tax reforms by which um, you, could, you could help expand the base like we talked about earlier. The fact is, in our budget choices document every year, we publish more options for raising revenue than I'd have the time to go through if I had the entire time for this presentation up here. So I'll let you read them behind me. The one thing I will say in relation to tax reforms, and this isn't a way of generating tax, but refundable tax credits. In refundable tax credits, the government has potentially, if it would uh, choose to implement, a very powerful tool with which to tackle the working poor issue and increase the fairness of the tax system. Um, if anyone, anyone who read our budget response document in October this year will have seen that one of the effects of the tax changes that were brought in was that the cohort of people, the tax units, if you will, and I don't really like that phrase, but the tax units between 15,000 euros and 25,000 a year benefited almost nothing compared to people on lower incomes and higher incomes. And part of the reason for that is that the government doesn't have a mechanism whereby it can officially, efficiently uh, tackle those people without seeing a lot of the benefits skewed to higher earners. You bring in refundable tax credits, you have that, and you have the potential <coughs> to ensure that all taxation benefits go equally to everybody who has an income. And in relation, finally, to the minimum effective corporation tax that we've been advocating for since, since Sean Healy was a boy. Um, I don't understand the resistance to it from government because uh, well, we're, we're not even saying we're not even saying implement the 12.5 percent that we have as the headline rate, which is, which is such an article of faith in Irish politics nowadays. We're saying would you at least implement half of it? And the only people it's going to, or the only organisations it's going to affect, are the ones that are on a regular basis paying two or three percent um, each year. We won't name them, but we do believe that. There's a potential to raise between a billion and two billion euros every year by the implementation of that minimum effective rate. And as Michelle mentioned, um, from a fairness point of view, you need 
people need to need to see that it's not just them that are being burdened with um, with taxation in the society that corporations and other entities are paying their fair share as well. So from that point of view, it's also very important. I'll pass you over to Colette. Thank you. And I'm going to bring you to the last two priorities in our um, proposed <coughs> programme for government, the fourth of which being governance. Now, this is an area, unfortunately, where we are lacking in a, a number of, of key areas. Um, just six of them that we would wish to see prioritised in the new programme for government. Uh, the first one would be the financial governance you know, we're still all bearing the brunt of light touch at best financial regulation um, in the last number of years. We're seeing it in the high level of mortgage arrears, particularly in the persistent and pervasive level of late stage mortgage arrears. We're seeing it in unsustainable levels of household debt. We're seeing it in sales to vulture funds. Um, we're even seeing it in, you know, the number of single household accidental landlords. The only reason they exist is because financial policy was such that we encouraged people to buy homes they couldn't afford. They then had to rent them. Those homes are now starting to hit um, peak price again. Those landlords are leaving and they're leaving in droves. And we are hitting a critical mass here where we're again looking at a housing crisis and increasing an already unsustainable and unacceptable housing crisis. The second area we need to look at um, is around government and the Oireachtas. And Theresa has, has said far, far better than I will um, the need for reform around local government and the need for more participation around local government in decision making at local level. Um, we also need to look at the findings of Machen Tribunal in relation to decisions that are taken and how they need to be transparent and open when taken in the common good. Um, you know, the, the outcome of the Shannon reform referendum was instructive in that, you know, a, a considerable proportion of people voted to, for Shannon reform, voted to have some level of transparency, voted to broaden the selection process um, for our higher levels of government. And that needs to be considered. Those th options need to be looked at. We also need to look at how we engage in our budget and our national budgetary processes. Again, given the, the, the high level of centralisation in this regard, you know, this is a critical issue for us. It's one of the, the major policy issues in Ireland is around the, board, the budget process. Yet in 2015, the OECD stated that Ireland's budget engagement with the houses of the Oireachtas was the lowest of, EU, uh, or sorry, of OECD countries. We need more engagement. We also need to have a, distri a distributional impact analysis um, alongside our budget documents to inform public debate and to engage you know, in, in a social dialogue around budget decisions. For example, if we had in advance um, a public discourse on the fact that in the last budget, those earning 75,000 a year um, benefited 10 times more than those earning 25,000, would decisions have been different? Um, we also need to look at impact assessments and poverty proofing and transparency around our budgetary processes. The fourth area for governance would be land speculation. Um, again, we go back to the 2012 recommendations uh, from the Mahan Tribunal around planning. And while there have been some improvements, particularly around the fast tracking of processes, um, even that is starting to cause difficulties for those planning applications who don't meet the criteria for the fast track. Um, we hark back to the 1974 report, the, the Kenny report, that said that a proportion of the gain achieved as a result of public policy um, be, in, in terms of land be secured for the benefit of the community. Now that's a, a critical issue and we would go so far as to say those gains should be ring-fenced and put back into the capital provision for social and affordable housing, particularly around social housing given that it's been decimated in the last number of years. The fifth would be around social dialogue and deliberative democracy, and there are gains being made in this, and we heard from a number of PPNs in the room um, throughout the day. And that was a, a key piece from 2014 that was introduced. However, you know, while there have been some improvements, and again, that the national economic dialogue that was discussed earlier on was a step in the right direction as well. We need to move beyond pure economics. We need to talk about a national dialogue for sustainable economical, economic, environmental and social development and what that needs to look at, or sorry, look like. 
Um, a key initiative of the vision for, or sorry, of the PPNs was uh, alluded to earlier on by Donal when he talked about the vision for community well-beings, and that talks about you know six interdependent domains that are critical for all of policy. And if that can be fed up from communities into local governments, into general governments, we have a real chance at a sustainable society here. Those six domains are economy and resources, um, social and community development, participation, democracy and good governance, um, health, both physical and mental, environment and sustainability. And you, know, you can see that they are interdependent, that there is you know, a, a, a real need for dialogue across the spectrum, that it can't be siloed anymore. Uh, finally, of the six, we, we need to really focus around transparent negotiation. We need to look at you know, the, the five questions that Social Justice Ireland has, has put to the National Economic Dialogue um, in the last number of years. Where should Ireland be in the next 10 years? How, or sorry, what services and infrastructures do we need to get there? How are those services to be delivered? How are they going to be paid for? And again, Eamon talked about you know, our, our many, many proposals around um, budgetary reform and ta you know, revenue raising measures that could have been implemented, but, but unfortunately were not. Um, how can we maintain a vibrant and sustainable economy and society? And until we have a proper public discourse around this that involves all the stakeholders, um, then really we're on a hiding to nothing. Like, we need to include everyone in this debate. We're all affected by the decisions of government. We have all felt the impact of poor decisions in the last, particularly in the last 10 years. We all deserve a say in how the next programme for government is going to be shaped. Um, and then the fifth uh, priority then in, in our particular programme for government is sustainability. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future. Um, to do this, we would say that we must focus on environmental sustainability, so the promotion of climate justice and uh, protecting the environment, economic sustainability and promoting balanced regional development, social sustainability, developing new economic and social indicators outside of, of the traditional GDP model. We also need to look at climate. It's no longer enough to look to adopt ambitious targets. We've had them, we've missed them. 2020, we're looking at hefty fines in addition to the damage that's being done to the environment and to, to future generations and the resources that future generations need. We are going in the opposite direction in terms of, of emissions. We're actually dragging Europe down. We need to seriously address that, not in the next, you know, in the next 12 years. We need to start now. Um, and just to say, like a, a key component of, of the programme for government must be to develop a comprehensive mitigation and transition programme to accompany the ambitious climate policy. So yes, there was a robust discussion, to put it nicely, um, between Irish Rural Link and, and CARA earlier on today. We would still advocate for the introduction of a carbon tax, but we would also advocate for you know, a real focus on people in low income groups who are experiencing fuel poverty, who are reliant on, on the bag of coal and the, the tank of oil. But that's not, that's not to say we shouldn't do the carbon tax as well. You know, if, if government really didn't introduce carbon tax because they were concerned about the woman in the cold house, they would have done more than introduce an 84 cent increase to the fuel uh, allowance. They would have put, pumped money into the sustainable homes initiatives. They would have looked realistically at retrofitting community halls and, um, and older homes, but they didn't. Um, so really, you know, we, need to, we absolutely need a transition program, but we need to start talking about it and we need to start thinking across the spectrum for it. In terms of rural development, um, yes, there is definitely a, a two-tiered recovery between urban and rural areas, and that needs to be tackled. We need to balance regional development through the provision of services and capital spending we need broadband across rural Ireland. It is just unsustainable not to have it. It is absolutely unacceptable that it has taken this long. We are six years with a, a broadband programme that is going nowhere. And we also need sustainable um, and, and environmentally friendly public, public transport. 
In terms of looking at you know, new social indicators, we need to go beyond economy as a measure of progress and look at measuring the environmental, financial sustainability, well-being, happiness. That was stated back uh, in 2009 in a report by the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. And it's still as relevant today because we have still just ignored it, essentially. Finally, in this area, we need to, to look at you know, properly adopting the SDGs. It is a 17-point plan for all the world. It contains 169 targets that involves ending poverty, having climate change, uh, fighting injustice and inequality. And SDG 19 looks at you know, partnership for the goals. Um, when we talk about that, we talk you know, generally about our ODA. And we are quite good. Ireland is one of the, one of the areas we are quite good at, is um, providing high quality, untied, grant-based aid. In Budget 2019, we made a serious step towards that when you know, our, our ODA went to 0.39% of GNI star. We need to get it to 0.7% by 2025. And finally, I suppose, how do we get where we need to be? We need to increase spending, particularly capital spending, on the things that matter. We need housing, we need infrastructure, we need hospitals, we need schools that aren't about to fall down. Um, we need to change um, how services are, are being delivered so that they're being deliver delivered effectively and efficiently. That we're not throwing money at a problem that's just getting worse. Um, we need open debate and deliberative democracy that, that calls for participation from everybody involved. And we need a new and progressive ideas and ambitions around sustainability so that we can actually achieve our goals. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much to everyone here. A very comprehensive um, look into the future. Um, any contributions, questions from the floor? Yeah, we've done it here. Um, thanks. I'd, I'd just be brief. Um, I suppose really listening to the four speakers, it reminds me of something a manager used to say to me when I was obviously used to always say, look, if you want to progress something, give me a solution, don't give me a problem. And in the context of what I started out with there, the UN Convention, the rights of people, like those three core philosophies clearly outlined by Fergus Findlay, Sean, I suppose. If we can take those forward, I'd say we're well on the way and we have the structures locally, uh, working collaboration with the local authorities. Uh, the flaky language, I suppose, that's been there and been banded around uh, over 10 years now will not progress this. And in fairness to Finian McGrath, he has on um, headed paper to myself personally, a willingness to commit, engage, and progress this uh, on finding an overarching body. So the, 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 the sense of philosophy through the PPN, which is why I'm pushing this so hard, is there, the structure is there through the social inclusion strand in particular right now, as both you and I saw at the PPN National Conference, the opportunity to bring it to the next level, feed it into the NAG, they refer to it as the National Advisory Group, and uh, I'd be very optimistic if we stay with that, that the framework is there to progress it. But the time scales are talking of, Sean, it's not, it's not realistic, it's not pragmatic. It won't hold the PPN together. The PPN can fall down on the likes of this. I've no doubt about that, because we're already talking, Leash, about succession planning. It's coming up um, in May of 019. We had a meeting last night, we looked at one another, and there's a sense of despondency. So it's very, very important that initiatives of this nature are brought to the next level, are seen to be producing fruit, progress, and you know, I think people genuinely with social conscience will stay on board. But that's, that's my input. Thank you. Just a very simple thing. I think the measure of a government uh, on the issue of disability and whether or not they're committed to the US convention and so on is whether there's investment. We have very strongly argued and provided for in our budget, for example, our fully costed budget in advance of this year's budget that we published last June, we provided for the introduction of a cost of disability payment. Everybody with a disability has an additional cost. Now, there can be variations about how much given the disability, but there's no question, nobody doubts that they have additional costs. Our view is that there should be a uh, cost of disability payment introduced into the system 
radical change, makes a difference, uh, but it requires investment. Uh, we've been arguing this for quite a while. We will continue to do so. I will basically measure government by what it does. Will it put the investment in? And that will be uh, where we're coming from. It's part of our programme for government, our proposal, OK? Whether government takes it up, whatever. Next government, we'll see. Anybody else? Yeah, we've, just, uh, we'll get the microphone to you, sorry. I'm interested to hear where you take the debate and the participation um, of these proposals that you're putting forward today. Sorry? What are you going to do with what you're proposing now okay. going uh, forward? How are you going to well, get the public to hear this and participate in the in, in the in everybody embracing it and it, it becoming the program okay. of the next oh, yeah. government? Uh, uh, simple, uh, no, a number of different things, right? Um, the, um, sorry, we're putting videos of this particular conference up on our website for a start, okay? The most important thing that we will do, I think, is that we will supply or we will provide uh, the details of this programme to each political party, every political party in Leinster House. And we will be uh, talking to them and urging them to talk to us about this. And one of the major political parties has already agreed to meet us as a team uh, in the month of November, so we, hopefully before this month is out, but they've said the month of November uh, to discuss uh, what it would look like in practice. So we will push it in that space, okay? We will push it in any other space that we get an opportunity to, do, to, to push it in as well, I think, okay? We are obviously publishing the material all the time as well. Just on, on, on that theme, Sean, I mean, anybody, I think, I think it would be fair to say anybody seeing the proposals here, very well researched, very well thought out, and to a large extent, common sense. Mm -hmm. And most of them, and I think you'd have a huge majority of people would agree with that. Yet, it would seem in our system that those who are coming from a different perspective, particularly with vested interests, and I'm thinking about in business and what have you, seem to have a far greater purchase on the body politic and that ability to push through. The most recent obvious example, I think, would be the, the public alcohol bill and the manner in which the industry was able to hold that up for two years quite amazingly. Why is it, does it seem, that people coming from that perspective seem to, have, seem to get their way far easier with the body politic? Uh, I'm answering too many questions here, well, no, but yeah, um, I, I think there's a critical issue about the way uh, these things are communicated. Um, we, we have a, a, a I'm not being critical of the media, and on top of that, there's some very good media people here today, okay, <laughs> including yourself, Mick, um, that we would have great time for and uh, we'd, we would admire. But the g media generally supports the status quo. It doesn't challenge the status quo. Uh, not alone that, uh, it is actually owned or controlled by the economically powerful or the politically powerful or both. Okay? And when I say the controlled by the politically powerful, I'm talking about the kind of rules and regulations and so on. Okay? So it, it, it requires a sophistication on the part of the electorate to challenge that so that they say, we don't actually buy this nonsense. We need proper uh, communication, okay? And like, I'd be interested, like I find it interesting, for example, just putting stuff out there and, and seeing how it goes. Tony Fahey uh, had an op-ed on, based on his paper today, published on the journal last night, okay? And by this morning, there were over 25,000 views of that particular article. And there was a whole stack of comments and no more, no, no different to uh, Christine herself. I don't usually read comments because they're usually abusing us. Uh, but in actual fact, there was almost every comment in it is positive, okay? Now, this is sort of trying to find ways. We continue to try to find ways to get around it, okay? And to try and sort of, be very interesting to see, will this conference be, be covered in the mainstream media on the news side of it. Now, one of the ways we're trying to get around that at the moment is we're trying to get a series of op-eds po uh, published in different uh, publications, okay? But um, 
they, like we have to be kind of creative in that sense. The bottom line is that people uh, need to be much more on top of challenging uh, what they're getting to ensure that it is actually telling them the whole story, first of all, providing the real options. Okay? Yeah, we've. Uh, man here. I'm answering another question. Uh, thanks. I, I was actually going to come in on that. Um, I think there's three pieces to that uh, discussion, if you like. I think the lack of uh, a coherent political left in Ireland, I think, is, it, it, you know, to take up a cause politically, I think, is, is part of the problem. But I, I think um, also the, 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 the discourse that says the economy is the be all and end all is very deeply ingrained and getting deeper and deeper even more deeply in the public consciousness and it's very difficult to come up with a counter discourse or counter narrative or counter story that doesn't sound like a Trotskyite as somebody said that doesn't you know and you see it in the in the US where somebody as uh, uh, Barack Obama is called a communist you know I mean this is these are shades of right right wing you know so uh, I, I think that's uh, very difficult to combat that. I, I think the, the, the sustainable goals are very, very powerful. I think the idea that was came up on the slides there about a rights-based approach, I think, is very powerful because people are very conscious of, of, of rights. I think that's good. And, and I think the other thing just to, to, to note is uh, one of the values of this kind of forum is that it is a very civilized uh, arena for, for, for dissent and for public discourse. And we had robust conversations, and they were very productive. Uh, I think we are these kinds of arenas, though, in the public are shrinking, and uh, it's much more difficult now to have a civilized discussion on a contentious issue without being branded as a maniac or w one thing or the other. You know, and I, I think the preservation of that uh, civilized public sphere is very, very important. And unfortunately, the media, a lot of the media outlets, not the uh, not some of the respected ones, but a lot of the media outlets are actually becoming more incendiary more populist uh, uh, um, and, and eliminating that uh, sphere for serious evidence-based discourse. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose you mentioned there the, you know, the economic narrative has taken over the discourse, but there, there is a counter narrative and I suppose it's up to us to ar articulate that. And yes, the space is shrinking, but you know, people need to have you know, to analyse the news critically, I mean, people don't present as homeless. That's the new language, you present as homeless, implying that, are you really homeless? Is it your fault you're homeless? No, you're homeless, through no fault of your own. You're not presenting because you feel like you're homeless. It's, it's about people critically analysing that type of language and, you know, reading between the lines. How do we combat it? I mean, yes, you, the civilised arena, I suppose, for public discourse is shrinking, but we have to look, you know, there's a part for all of us to play in this, but I would say particularly apart for the mainstream media, I'm, I'm just taking climate change as an example, you know, for when it does actually get on to mainstream current affairs shows, and it's not that often, what you usually has, have is a climate denier arguing with somebody who actually is saying we need to do something about climate change. That is not helpful. What you should really have is a representative from the agricultural sector there and a representative from another sector thinking about how are we going to manage our transition? How do you support rural communities to do this? Let's be realistic about what we need to do instead of about arguing you know, is climate change happening or not? Of course it's happening. And all we're doing at the moment is giving farmers more money because there's droughts and there's floods on the one hand, and on the other hand, not actually implementing some sort of programme to help us move our economy and our society towards, a, you know, a more sustainable foundation. Um, I do think we are in danger of losing the ability to have robust discussions with people who might have different views and opinions. Um, as you're right in, in terms of it does, at times it can descend into sort of, uh, if you, f 
you know, if you if you if you support social housing, uh, Emmett Kerman mentioned earlier, you're a trot. You're a trotskit. No, you're not. You just support good, well-funded public infrastructure and public services. But one thing I will say, having attended the National Economic Dialogue for a number of years, that is still an arena for civilised debate. We don't all agree. I would probably disagree strongly with some of the other interests there. But it is a forum where people will discuss the issues based on evidence. So we can make changes and government can make changes, but it's all down to their priorities um, and who they listen to and whose voices they listen to. So there is an election coming up. There's going to be the European and local elections next May, whether or not there's a general election before that. So it's incumbent on all of us, when someone comes knocking on your door looking for your vote, be clear about what your priorities are and challenge them on how they're going to represent you and how they're going to do the best for the country. I think, are you jumping in there, Donald? I'm <laughs> Very briefly, if you yeah. can. I just throw it open to either of the people on the table. Um, in relation to media, and I, I know this has gone very sophisticated in recent time, but like, do we not control a degree as well in terms of what we put out there? I'm sure there are very sophisticated methods going through all the mechanisms and what's shared today, but in terms of what we wish to pitch, I'm not saying by 8 o'clock in the morning to have it out in terms of the front. But if we were go back, is it 87 we started off? We'd probably have a sense of photo photograph from this and kind of one, two, three, four, five bullet points, you know, getting it out there. Maybe that's a bit simplistic, but it's just coming across to me. Maybe, maybe we're losing an element of that in terms of um, how, how we're relaying it or engaging. Donald, we put an extraordinary effort into getting publicity, yeah, believe I, I me. Think to be fair, we, had, yeah. we had two people working all day here on communications, the whole day, mm -hmm. two people. For two I professionals, not, not, not part of our organisation, brought in specifically to do it, okay? Um, we ourselves have circulated um, more than 800 journalists uh, on four occasions in advance of this, okay? Three occasions anyway, maybe, I think maybe four. Um, we will send every single one of them. In fact, in the last couple of hours, Michelle spent part of the time actually getting a news release about the whole, uh, the, the whole event and so on, out uh, to those 800 journalists. Okay, so um, we have somebody at this very moment uh, contacting, first of all, I've contacted all the uh, newspapers and all those kinds of things, and then uh, following that up with contacts to all the radio and TV programs uh, for this tonight, tomorrow, every single one of them, right? Okay, so... Like, it's not an issue about not that we don't do this. We do an extraordinary amount of this. Uh, people say to us, James, you get an awful lot of coverage. Not for the <laughs> amount of effort we put in. And all four of us here actually do media. Like, so all of us get interviewed in different ways on different spaces. And, and, and that national, local, radio, TV, we write articles for newspapers, all that sort of stuff. Okay. We'll, we'll take one final contribution here, just because we are stuck. Just, we'll take this just quickly if we can. Yeah, sorry. The local elections are next May. And is it something, I firmly believe that you need to work from local upwards. So, and your conference is fantastic, but I've come from Kilkenny and I know it's podcast, but I don't have broadband. Hey, decent broadband. Okay, so they're the two things. Don't have rural transport either. But that's another point. My point is that it's local election time next May. These things, that the, the points that you've put there and that you're lobbying government to introduce should be done at local level as well. So use the local elections next May to do that. And I will help you do that in Kilkenny. Absolutely, I agree. And being from Kilkenny, I <laughs> know exactly what it's like in terms of rural broadband and infrastructure. But you're right, the local elections are a key point in this because that's when all the councillors are going to be knocking on everyone's door. I mean, we do an election briefing every time there is an election. That will be circulated to all our members. It will also be circulated to every PPN. So it gets out there so people, you know, they can read these priorities and then... As you said, when people come looking for their vote, this is how you influence it. This is how you make your choices. Look at the priorities that you want. Look at how they can possibly be delivered. So if somebody promises you, if they promise you rural broadband and decent public transport service, ask them how they're going to deliver it. Really challenge them on it. And that's how you can use your vote. You use your vote to influence from local to national to European level. But it's really important that people do that and that they're critically engaged. You know, they really challenge their representatives on you know, what they're doing, what policies they're implementing and why they're implementing certain policies. Okay, 
On that note, uh, I think we'll have to, unfortunately, bring the conference to a close. I think it's been a really excellent conference, if I may say so. The contributions we've had were very varied. They, they went right across society, and I think we've had some fantastic ideas aired here today in a lot of different sectors, so I hope it has been as fulfilling for all of you as I feel it has been. Before we finish, Sean is just going to have a couple of final words to uh, bring the curtain down on things. I just want to say thank you to everybody, and I'm conscious there's over 60 people still here, which is terrific from our perspective, and we're, we really appreciate it. So thank you for coming, thank you for staying, and especially say thank you to the people who are watching us uh, uh, on the, 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 the uh, web, the, the web on, on, on the web. Uh, I've got quite a number of texts from friends today from different parts of the country with uh, comments about things that they have heard on uh, on the various webcasts today. So thanks for everybody to everybody out there. We got lots of ideas, proposals, suggestions on answering that question from here to where. We're delighted uh, to engage with all of those, and we'll certainly take up every offer, including the one from Kilkenny that we talked about there. Uh, we say thanks to the speakers, all the speakers of the conference, um, and we will say thanks to the five young people. I'm not going to start listing all the names now, um, but uh, the five young people who addressed us, and we say thanks to the youth, National Youth Council uh, who, who set that up, um, and thanks to Finbar Tracy and uh, the Kairos team um, for transmitting uh, um, the, the whole live stream and for the two days' work, because they were here all day yesterday setting it up and getting it all done today. A special thank you to Mick Clifford, who did an excellent job, I think, in fairness, and I think we should maybe especially acknowledge him. Vid videos of all the sessions will be on our website and on YouTube uh, very shortly. Uh, the book containing all the papers will also be on our website uh, very shortly, uh, and so they have the electronic version of it. Um, and in, so I think that's as much as, as to do, except that uh, Social Justice Ireland's AGM will be taking uh, place 15 minutes after the conclusion of this event. Oh, and there are value, people collected. Uh, you got an evaluation form when you arrived this morning for those who are here, and if you actually complete it, um, uh, they, you, and if you do that, uh, if you complete them, you drop them in on the way out. There's a box down there. And one final thank you. He's still working down there on his cartoons. <laughs> Philip, uh, your cartoons are fantastic. I think yeah, all sorts of people are thinking. And they, have, they have been all over Twitter all, all day, people uh, doing it, and they too will be available on our website uh, within a matter of days. So thanks, Philip, especially. Thank you all.